Greetings, everybody. Welcome to our collaborative, Peace Engineering Echo Collaborative. So let's get uh, started. Let's start with a couple of announcements. Welcome again to the Peace Engineering Echo Collaborative. It's about transforming perspectives for a sustainable global future. So we need you to imagine, design, and create. That's what Peace Engineering is all about. On the next slide, please. This is a definition of peace engineering. I'm not going to spend time on it, but uh, you will have access to the slides. And if you need more information about peace engineering, please contact us. Next slide, please. These are the rules of engagement. If you're an engineer or a mathematician, these are the boundary conditions. So this session is being recorded. Please type in your name, email, and affiliation in the chat so we know who you are. If you're not speaking, please mute yourself. We don't want to introduce background noise. We will have a question and answer session after Bruce's presentation. We will be monitoring the chat, so please ask your questions there so we have them ready when we get start the Q&A. And if bandwidth allows, uh, that, that depend on your region, you may need to turn off your video so you don't uh, waste bandwidth. Next slide, please. The title of today's Peace Engineering Echo Collaborative is Peace Engineering Finance. How might we? It's so important that we address the issue of finance. We tend to kind of put this on the side and we don't do a good job in educating engineers and practicing. So this talk is so important for uh, the future of not only engineering, we're talking about changing the mindset of every discipline and we need to create new ones to address global challenges. So I'm very proud to introduce Bruce Gahan to talk about this topic. Next slide, please. Bruce is a colleague and a good friend. He's part of the Peace Engineering Consortium. He believes that we can make a difference. He's an attorney, he's also an economist. He knows a lot about finance and how we can connect the dots and, and value what, what we're doing. Whether it's with intended or unintended consequences, we need to put a value to it. Bruce, thank you so much for uh, giving this presentation and I, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Ramiro, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's great to see everybody so early in the morning. Um, I am still on my first half cup of coffee, so hopefully I'll, I'll be somewhat um, sane. As Ramiro said, um, I think there's a level of financial engineering that should be built up, taught alongside of peace engineering. And in the rooms that I seem to wander into, uh, whether it's at Stanford or, or UNM or elsewhere, uh, finance is a missing language. Um, and, and so we have to overcome that. You, you've heard my bio. Um, I'm a recovering Wall Street lawyer, Hong Kong merchant banker, geospatial technology finance pioneer for the federal government, 9-11 responder, Ashoka fellow, and I teach finance and ethics at Stanford in the School of Engineering and in uh, the design school. I do a lot, so it confuses people that, that I do what I do. But in, in the um, gold area, you see the, the um, activities of relevance that, uh, that uh, I pursue that I think relate to uh, peace engineering. So don't be confused. Um, you know, if, if we look at the universe of finance, um, it helps to know where you want to go. And traditionally, finance is full of jargon and acronyms, and it's opaque. And you know, you can go to investopedia.com and figure out what what it is and what it isn't. Um, all, uh, finance's main purpose is to name, grade, 
transfer pool and hide risks as compared to their returns on investment. As I've talked to Ramiro um, and others in the ECHO uh, project, I think that um, there is, we could compute a return on piece, an ROP. Um, so these are the um, uh, constraints uh, that engineers would well understand that finance navigates by. Finance connects a spectrum of time horizons and risks, uh, risk appetites and lives, uh, whether it's the short term uh, trading of, of hedge funds and venture capital, uh, the patient capital of pension funds. Uh, this is a Rubik's cube that matches a particular investment the way it's been structured to the uh, customer or the investor for, for that. It, it's important to realize that finance until relatively two decades ago, really was a laggard in um, technology adoption, particularly as it came to data science. Um, that there were many industries that finance serves that were going much more rapidly toward um, computerization and using that data. And, and much of the data that's um, uh, spun off of the industries that finance uh, funds isn't yet fully appreciated or used in uh, finance for risk uh, determinations. These new technologies, I mean, finance has been adopting new technologies forever. Um, the, the, the check uh, was, was a technology, the credit card was a technology, ATMs are a technology. Um, but but the, the technologies don't necessarily, um, they may change how we move money, they don't necessarily change the impacts or even the feedback loops for the impacts that, that finance creates. So, some say, say banks will never change. Um, and yet we see um, that traditionally banks did not take into account the impacts of their loan portfolios. That is changing, uh, not fast, but it is changing. And data science, particularly as we've discussed with, with uh, Ramiro and the possibility of the, the various national labs and other data sources coming to the table for this, this is very exciting to aim um, evidence-based finance uh, into the world. So it is a maze of actors. Um, I use this report from uh, 2010. This is right after the financial crisis. This is a report from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, where they tried to understand what in the world blew up in 2010. So it was kind of a forensic analysis. Um, and they analyzed uh, the shadow banking system. And the shadow banking system isn't mafia, though I guess that would qualify. It's the un, un or less regulated portions of the financial system. Things like private equity, limited partnerships, or, or um, um, uh, some of the pension funds and the rest um, that, that invest in uh, not bank regulated. The bank regulated in this slide is just the top layer that you see the everything bounded in gold and uh, green and purple. These are the unregulated actors, but it's very much necessary for the regulated banking system to move investment risk outside itself into um, pools of investors who want to buy that risk and hold that risk. Think about a swap agreement. Will interest rates go up or down for a currency swap. Uh, there are many, many of those types of financial instruments. Um, and, but really all this circuit board and, and, you know, I'm talking to electrical engineers on this call, so you'll, you'll correct me, of course. Um, all this circuit board, if it were a circuit board, if this financial system were on a chip, is doing its transforming risk, return, asset type 
at maturity? How long is the money in that form? And so it's very much um, like a, a circuit that moves things. It, it doesn't do it as efficiently as digital circuits and there's costs and delays and, and handling uh, um, charges, if you will, for the way that the system is, is used in its analog for, uh, function. Um, but ultimately finance relies on the real economy. The real economy is different than the financialized or synthetic economy. The real economy um, is something that, that feeds people or makes them healthy or uh, lets them travel. Uh, so, so those are the real economic activity that, that you, if you were to, to draw a, um, a, a picture of what the banking and the financial systems are really doing, it might look like this. And this is a slide that took four hours to um, discuss and negotiate with a good friend who, who headed the Aero Astra department at Stanford. Um, he said, Bruce, you got one slide to explain the entire banking system. This is after four hours is what we came up with. Um, so depositors put their money into, into banks. Um, the bank owes them safety. The bank puts that money into investments, uh, which are really uh, claims on real assets. So they can be at a fixed rate of interest or variable or uh, the banks trade uh, funds between themselves. And, and then the real assets are people or businesses or cities. And to the extent that we need liquidity uh, so that when you would go to the ATM, you could get cash uh, or businesses can, can pay their workers. Um, some of those uh, funds are, are left in, in uninvested form, but the entire system is, is um, riding on the impacts of that real asset layer. And, and that's where peace engineering, I think, can make a huge, huge contribution to stabilizing and making certain that the financial system uh, is sustainable and doesn't speculate beyond it. So here you see um, spread of banks live on the difference between what they earn on their investments or loan portfolios and what they have to pay for deposits, which is usually negligible. Um, and then banks really don't know how to operate real assets. They don't know how to operate a hotel or a farm um, or a business. So to the extent that um, they would have the business intelligence of what impacts are needed and what proportion to others, they would make better decisions on the real assets that they want to be funding to create and trust would, would be greater because people would know where their money lived last night when they slept and uh, and that would be good for, for the system to be more transparent as to its impacts and how the loans will be repaid or the investments will pay off. Um, economics does explain a lot of the process for moving capital to its highest purpose. Um, this is a something called the in integrated reporting framework. Uh, and it hypothesized that there are uh, six forms of capital. And if, if in the middle, you, you imagine that's a, a, a company, uh, the company is taking inputs of financial, manufactured, intellectual, human, social, and natural capital. So those are the inputs. And the outputs are, it, they have changed and, and hopefully added to but not degraded those uh, forms of capital. And there's some uh, companies that are starting to report in, in, a, in addition to their required financial reports, they're reporting their integrated um, framework impacts. Um, so I've suggested that we need storytelling money. And there are stories that the depositors or the investors, uh, when you invest in your retirement funds, um, you represent a story, or you like to think you are a story. And then um, the, the party, the invested uh, company or uh, the borrower uh, from a bank would be also a story. Maybe they are a, um, a sustainable food uh, uh, grower or, or a restaurant or whatever, um, 
or they build health uh, for, for vulnerable regions. Well, a sustainable bank or a sustainable investment fund puts those two stories together and, and lets people see that their money actually is creating safety, fairness, and impacts um, through, through knowing where the money was invested and the relative importance of that um, activity in the real economy. Um, for this, I've, I've decided that we need a periodic table of uh, impacts, which I call a periodic table of quality of life. And when I started to, to research that, and I went back and I looked at the early uh, periodic charts, um, I saw two amazing things. One was that the um, uh, scientists of the day um, used the periodic table to be their shareware, to be their uh, Wikipedia, to say, this is what we know to measure. And <clears throat> this is um, how it relates to other things we know to measure. But they also did something incredibly humble which was um, they left blank spaces for things they didn't know would be what to call them or how to measure them, <clears throat> excuse me. But they knew those elements must exist for the entire table to make sense. And as life has gone on and as the national labs and others have found uh, with, with their NSF uh, activity, uh, we've changed some of the atomic weights and found new elements. Well, what if we were to build a periodic table of quality of life elements right now? We, we might start with health. Health is pretty important during a pandemic period. And, and we would find that, you know, we could budget as much as we want. We could build a lot of hospitals and health clinics. Uh, this is very important, I think, for the Pueblo in New Mexico. But um, one of the reasons that people get sick has to do with the urban systems and the engineering of those urban systems or the failures to re-engineer and clean up the water and the sanitation, the other thing. And then you would ask, well, what is the source of energy that those, um, uh, that that city where those people live are, are using? Um, is it polluting the air? And then you would ask, how is that contributing perhaps to climate change? So in a very few mouse clips, I've shown you a couple of key concepts for the periodic uh, table of quality of life. Adjacencies, how do the various elements relate to each other? Um, does having more urban uh, engineering reduce the cost of healthcare, the functional values at risk. This borrows a concept called VAR or value at risk, which um, uh, fund managers would ask, well, if I buy or sell an Apple stock today, what is that going to do to my overall portfolio yield uh, a year from now? And, and so I put an F in front of the VAR for functional value at risk. What is the functional value to all of the other elements in the table being in balance of having better urban system or better energy, et cetera. And then sustainable resiliency is a score that I've uh, uh, designed for the table that says if I, what is the likelihood over 10 years that there will be at least a 10% improvement in every element of our table um, based on balancing the kind of technologies and, and investments that we make. And this is this periodic table is driven off of um, government budget data. So you can imagine looking at the state of New Mexico's uh, budget over the last 10, 20 years, and filling in this table with both the amounts that were spent and the KPIs or key performance indicators that, that uh, were moved uh, with those investments. Um, switching to, to topics that, that I think we all care about is, is you know, people are, um, people are hurt. 
uh, many people are hurting. And this is a chart that shows uh, um, five slices of Americans. The bottom 20% owe 25% more than they have in net worth. The second owe 80% of their net worth. The middle owe a half of their net worth. The next owe 20% or 25% of their net worth. And, and that means that if finance is just making uh, people in debt, putting people in debt faster, like credit card debt, um, that's not necessarily healthy. It's technologically fun, but it's not healthy. And, and so I focus, um, and, and I like to explain that I, that I focus on uh, that blue Pac-Man slice of the pie of all the global GDP that is represented by the financial system. And you can't move the impacts of that pie merely by impact investing. It's just a scale that cannot you know, mathematically work. So we really have to look at how banks and financial markets are using um, data such as the periodic table would show for government finance debt, for example. Um, I like to, to show this chart, especially early in the morning, because we wake up in a normal population with a variety of, um, of personality types. And we need the diversity, the full diversity of those uh, personality types. Nature has evolved us to, to have those in our communities um, so that we can have risk taking and we can have folks asking, is it safe? And, and that's a healthy debate. Unfortunately, the banker personalities don't match the normal personality. So quoting from Young Frankenstein, they are Abby Normal, or I am Abby Normal as a banker. And, and the, the importance of that dichotomy is that you're trying, that society is trying to, to use the bankers, and by that I, I mean the financial markets as well, to allocate capital. But but the, the way in which the receiver of that information or the proposer of, of that investment is, is hearing it isn't necessarily the way the personality uh, types in the society would want that capital to flow. So if the, if the financial system is a gatekeeper for so, social capital, you've got a mismatch and, and basically you have some augmented personality, I don't know, intervention uh, that the financial system might need from evidence-based um, data that, that can show bankers why the real economy would be strengthened by certain uh, portfolio um, investments. Then, of course, as a lawyer, I have to show you this because I am a lawyer in three states. Lawyers are not normal people either, if you've ever interacted with lawyers. Um, and so you've got a, a society where the normal decision-making processes um, are, are certainly in, the, in a large part in the hands of people who are not representative uh, of the normal uh, tolerance for risk and, and, and um, prioritization of attention. Um, and, and so we, we need some technology to overcome these uh, structural personality Disorders, let us say. Um, economics is a unifying language, and, and it helps, certainly helped me to, um, to have conversations I, I had planned, but also uh, some that I had not. And here you see um, I've ended up at the Vatican and meeting the Pope, and uh, courtesy of, of my friend Cardinal Turkson, and I, I happen to be a Jewish boy from Philadelphia. Um, and uh, and I suggested by by sneaking a a, uh, uh, a redwood seedling tree into the Vatican, wrapped in a Stanford shawl, that we need banks that uh, can help us make decisions that last as long and stand as tall as as these trees. Um, the Pope has been incredibly outspoken about the need for the financial system to look at its impacts, to look at how it works. And, um, and I've, you know, courtesy of Cardinal Turkson and, and a few others, 
had input into helping um, to, to think about how to do that. You know, how, how the Vatican has a bank and it, it runs an asset management function to do that. This is actually a nutrition facts label that, uh, that we developed, um, uh, Father Seamus and I developed for managing um, uh, Catholic funds. So are they managed compliant with law? Which hasn't always been the case. Uh, for the amount of risk that they take, are they prudently um, invested? Um, and then most importantly, are they congruently invested? I can earn a return by investing in things that, that would be against uh, the doctrine and uh, and that how do we how do we have the transparency to to see um, this and most religious institutions um, um, whether it's Catholic or Jewish or, or others do not uh, report on this type of um, transparency level but mostly because their investment managers are not reporting it to them so data do speak for the poor and planet. And unfortunately, there is no economic model that I've found for uh, informal settlements or slums that could show how to pay people who live in a slum uh, to, to reduce the threats to themselves, whether it's um, uh, disease or, or other threats. And when I looked out in the research, I found lots of conversations about economic and lots of di nice diagrams. But I did not find an economic model. So I decided um, that we needed it and that we could use these quality of life impacts uh, basically team off of um, the government's expenses and exposures to risk from the slums to reward people for cleaning up trash or doing other things that they might be able to, to do. Um, I'm part of a group funded out of Welcome Trust in the UK to retrofit 12 slums in Fiji and 12 in Indonesia with clean water and sanitation. But typically with these development projects, if we go back three to five years later, there's uh, the, the intervention, the infrastructure has not been maintained. So it doesn't, it's a nice photo op, it doesn't make a difference. So for that, I decided to create uh, or propose a general economic model. Um, so they could uh, make a bridge between the formal and the informal economies, knowing that 70 to 80% of people who live in a slum have a cell phone and therefore could get a micro payment on their cell phone. And this is, you know, an early draft of, of the, the GEM, as I call it, uh, the general economic model. And it has a number of modules, the periodic table, a three-layered map of the world. So um, this is where our friends at SMD and the other national labs could be incredibly helpful. Um, what are the needs? What are the, the gaps in the KPIs of the periodic table? What are the capacities for cleaning water under similar circumstances? Is something in Indonesia and something in Israel similar enough from a chemical point of view or a weather point of view? That, that you you could use the capacity from one in the other. And then the money layer. Often um, we find that the people who can tell you there's a need, the NGOs know that there's money to solve it or have been responsible for, for collecting the money to solve it. Uh, or, the, or the contractors or others with capacities know uh, how to find the money to pay for it. But that leaves out the people who live in the slums, in this case, from this, uh, any learning, any self-determinism of prioritizing among all the different interventions, which is most needed. 
insularity and in interdependency, how far is the slum or the affected area, the fragile area from the city? Because that distance might might uh, uh, represent a value um, uh, constraint. What are the macro factors outside of local and regional control? Certainly weather, politics. Uh, what are the legacy cultural and religious economic traditions? Um, in my studies, every religion or, or, or uh, indigenous tradition has an economic component, and you can leverage that to, uh, with behavioral um, economics to, to cause people to act congruently to that um, belief system. Uh, the external investment and funding decisions, these are the annual you know, uh, RFPs and, and the episodic you know, we have money to do this, that, and the other thing from people who don't live in the area that you're trying to affect. And then, of course, there's the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which none of which have any budgeting uh, consequence. The, the, the cities and states typically do not budget to achieve those goals, but to translate this activity from the gym into a, uh, a language that the SDGs have created uh, we can we can do that. Um, so I think this is a new science of wellness and empowerment, and um, and for that, I think we could have sustainable resiliency bonds um, as an example of moving beyond impact investing or what I've called vanity philanthropy, and the one ring to rule them all. You know, if you don't, Bruce, if you don't care about climate change. Forget about curing poverty because we, we won't be here. I mean, let's stop that nonsense. Um, everything matters in some proportion to everything else. Um, so this would, would be um, using the, the various modules that you've seen me describe, um, but using uh, a city's output of risk in a much different way so as to uh, give the bondholders uh, assurance that the money that they have provided by buying the bonds is allocated to optimizing the balancing of risk through the periodic table and the other means. Um, this is true. All great changes are preceded by a bit of chaos, and certainly there's enough chaos in the world so that we have hopefully see some great changes in how we think and act. And, and impacts could be a commodity that we start to trade for the better. Um, and, and with that, I know Ramiro had some questions that we could consider, but, but why don't I, I just you know, go to the chat. I've not been looking at it. And Ramiro, if you can take us through a, a dialogue, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. I know there's a lot of interest here, and I, I, I have a lot of <laughs> also questions that I would like to ask, but I want to pass to the audience. I know uh, this is what you just talked has a direct connection to a previous peace engineering echo on health and climate change that Heidi Rogers gave, where she addressed the, the two things that are going to have major impact soon, if not already, is migration and infrastructure. And how do you finance that? And I think you touched that right smack. Oh, Haiti's here. Hi, how are you? So I will, if you can just let's start with that. I mean, how can we use these bonds, the impact bonds to finance this? Because we need, and the other thing that I, you know, we talked several times is transparency. It's so important. So I actually have a project in the Center for Human Rights and International Justice at Stanford that we call the, the Migration Storytelling Project. And um, this, um, I'm not obs obsessed with periodic tables, but just imagine a second periodic table and imagine that every migration journey goes through an arc 
and it starts with a set of catalyst conditions uh, in the place that people have left. Um, some are, are, are normal, some are not normal conditions. Um, then the people start leaving and they settle wherever they settle, either because they're exhausted or because um, they're welcomed. And then they have another set of conditions. And then finally, in the third part of the story, the third act, uh, occasionally they get to go back to their homeland. Um, and what are the conditions for that? This, um, the periodic table that I described of quality of life will be involved in all three parts of that um, journey. What we wanted to do, particularly for the purpose of uh, normalizing migration as a responsible human activity, is to say, you know, your family, Ramiro, and my ancestors went through different migration journeys. But the elements, if I were to semantically tag the stories, would be very similar. There was economic opportunity, there was some threats, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think if, if we could understand each other's um, migration journey in the semantics of it, we would have a little more empathy and we probably from policy making and economic uh, um, activity, be able to anticipate um, how to normalize the folks who are making these choices. And, and not deal with it as if it's some great surprise, because it is, it, it, the triggers are, are well known. People who work in this area, you know, ha, can, can explain that. What, what has not been done is to accommodate the, the investment uh, structures so that you are building um, schools or businesses with the people who are migrating. Um, to, to maximize. So for instance, if they're migrating from an agricultural area and we have food insecurity, sounds like the people who are coming into the area might know how to feed people. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I wanna reach out to Donna to help us with the questions in the chat. Heidi, you wanna, I know I used your, <laughs> the punchline of your talk to get the dialogue started, but I, I, it's, you may want to expand or at, say anything. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. This has just been such a, an incredible treat this morning. So thank you so much. And as the nursing member of the peace engineering community, um, um, I just deeply appreciate um, how we're all thinking about human resilience and what all of those qualities are. Cause you know, we think about that a lot in nursing. What are, the, what are the things that we need to be able to flourish? And, um, and I think one of the pieces from the talk that I gave last week is you know, this just this idea of, because it was really about climate change, is this idea of climate migration that, that is actually just, you know, it's, it's not for economic opportunity, it's because of a, you know, just this like, you know, this deficit hazard thing. And, um, and I've just been mulling around this idea of like, you know, sheltering in place as a concept and what is it that we can, how can we harness all of this work that we're doing to help people flourish in, in their communities where they already have social connection since, you know, since um, social connection is one of those key components to, to health and resiliency. Um, we know that, you know, after a natural disaster, people who have social connection are less likely to have food insecurity, are less likely to have, um, um, to become um, chronically homeless, all of those things. And so um, I just, you know, I don't know that I have a question. I just wanted to like say right on that you're doing this really cool work and thank you so much. You know, I mean, the, you're right, Heidi. The, um, I just think many of the things that we've seen as inconvenient risks are really disguised assets. But we just have, haven't have built the economic foundations 
which would then lead, you know, if I can't name, if I can't quantify something as a as a, a banker or an investor, I can't move the money to it. So until we can create the KPI, the key performance indicator, whatever it is, and it's not for the bankers and and the investment professionals to do that. It's up it's up to everybody but the bankers because you saw the personality issues. There. Um, you, you gotta quantify. You know what is the contribution of migrants to various societies? They they may be in, in a, a first year, second year, third year burden. But five years out, are they really the burden that you thought that they were? Or were they the way to reinvigorate a, a mining town or an industrial age town that nobody else wanted to be in for, for whatever reason? Um, so I, I do think we've mislabeled certain things and and we now need you know the benefit of whether it's IoT and, and uh, geospatial and, and, and every other thing that we have as data science to label things as they really, truly um, act in the real economy. Other questions? Donna, can you help me? Uh, yes, yes. Um, Mary Eggert has a question. Mary, would you go ahead and ask that? Um, yeah, it's a very interesting presentation. I really enjoyed it. And uh, just uh, many people talk about the issue of our not using a gold-backed currency, you know, the issuance of money contributing to the great wealth divide with the debtors, you know, never being able to catch up because of inflation. What is your view on that, Bruce? And how do you suggest uh, it be resolved? Um, well, I guess there are some who believe in Bitcoin. Um, I, I think I think it's nice to be able to tether. So, so uh, if you study uh, the Transcontinental Railroad, it is a story of uh, whether this country would be have a silver or gold backed currency. And there was hyperinflation when the colonies. Um, just kept issuing their own colonial money um, that Alexander Hamilton thought a national bank could could camp down as well as provide some solvency to those colony uh, governments. Um, you know, we need a, a basket of real goods to back the currency. Typically, the definition of what is a fiat currency is whatever the government accepts in uh, for tax payments. And um, some state and local governments are starting to, to collect taxes and accept Bitcoin. Now, I don't know what would happen if Bitcoin collapsed, but, but they are starting. I am not advocating for investments in Bitcoin, but I am suggesting that the ability to move money through that maze of circuitry that I showed you before is incredibly compressed. There's some good studies out of the World Economic Forum, the Davos crowd, looking at the future of the financial system and looking at what happens when you, you have those circuits, those gates that move money in accordance with, let us say, the Internet of Things data or where you need more um, uh, energy cheaper or where you need um, agriculture to be to be moved to a different uh, uh, type because of climate change. So uh, I'm in favor of currency that is backed by the real economy. This is my belief that I can, it's simpler for me to follow. Um, gold was a, a store of value which is one of the functions of money. Um, and it was very stable because it had two, it had a store of money, it, it had a store of value function, but it was also used in industry. Um, Bitcoin is not, it, it may or may not be a store of value, um, but it is not used in industry. Um, thank you, that's, that's very helpful. And it brings to mind just a, water as a monetary standard. 
like if we suddenly yep. backed every country i don't know if you, there's a guy who has that proposal i can send to you yeah sure please here i'll, I'll put my my email in the chat um i i think um there are many i'm actually creating a commodities exchange for outer space <laughs> watch bandwidth debris removal um so i'm in this wow and and that's a different talk and i do talk to the space forcey kind of people and 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 they're um uh it's it's important to have a balancing of how much you invest in a in producing particular commodities so you wouldn't want to over invest in launch systems and not when you get launched to some orbit have something there to do something else with you would want energy there you would want debris removal there um so you, 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 as you've seen in the great tulip and, and, uh, and even the subprime crisis, you, if you overinvest in any particular asset type beyond what the real economy needs it to perform relative to the other things, you get a collapse, not only in the assets value, but in all of the investments that go sour who who were collateralized by that asset or, or the functions of that asset so you right. need to which is the beauty of peace engineering as is strongly ramiro and i and donna have been talking about is that we're looking at a balanced approach mm -hmm. to, to how do regions stay in balance because it's in that balance that they actually have safety that they actually are providing for enough of everything every you're never going to have too much of, of, you know, health or whatever, but you, you could have um, people saying, well, if you don't put solar roofs on everybody's houses, um, then you're not providing adequately. Well, I don't want solar roofs on houses in places where they take the, the solar, sell it to pay for their health care. And in the meantime, commit crime. I mean, that's, so let's let's get off of this. Um, who is more virtuous by by having uh, allegiance to a particular aspect of strategy? Bruce, this is Raj. Hey, Raj. I have a question about your concept of funding uh, infrastructure for slums and poor communities is very interesting, but they don't have a voice in the political system. So who is going to speak up for them, saying? And I have heard and seen slums in India where they just grab whatever utility thing and they just take the existing electric wire and put a dangerous connection to it to their home. And do, same thing they do with water, you know. So this is something we cannot ignore. Otherwise, oh. our slums will become, you know, invade the nicer areas of our communities. Look, Raj, I, um, in the days when you could, uh, I, I went and gave a talk in Istanbul. And uh, they explained to me how every election season, the politicians walk through the slums and, and uh, they can see all this like uh, extension wire, so to speak, of people yeah. taking, taking the energy or the, the telephone for, for free. Um, and, and the politicians come through, they promise to upgrade, they never do. Yeah. I just think with the digital tools in hand, people who live in slums could have more agency in determining in that three layered map that I, that I quickly reviewed, uh, yeah. you know, a layer of money, uh, capacities and, and um, needs that they could hold themselves and the politicians to account for the sustainable resiliency, this balance um, of the periodic table that, that keeps their kids and their slum um, so bad. I'd like to try the experiment because I don't see the experiment of, of, of um, keeping all the decisions in New York or Washington or other places as, as being so eminently practical or wise. 
I, I, I think there's enough behavioral um, economics, but also, and you saw me just briefly touch on it, often these slums are in areas um, where people are faith observant yeah. or are faith, um, I don't know, um, Believers. They have a culture of, yeah, they have a culture of faith. And, and each of the faiths have an economic reality. I, I know the Jewish story. I know some of the other Abrahamic stories. Um, and, and, you know, why don't we provide the data that invoke the cultural norms of that economic tradition to the extent that those traditions would improve the conditions that are, that are around them? If you don't give people agency, they never learn to make a decision for themselves. Yeah. So telling them they don't know how to make a decision isn't really on them. And I think we can change that and we have to. Yes. I will write you a note about that further. Thank you. Sure, 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 sure. Next question, please, Donna. Um, we have a quick question uh, about where did you, where, what was the source of the personality data? And then after that, uh, George Rowe has a question and Josh Sperling has a question. Um, so I was in New York for 25 years and um, my ex-wife was a Freudian psychiatrist. That would be the flippant answer. But the true answer is that it um, comes from the Myers, and there is a Myers-Briggs website. And if you, if you really um, push me, I will go back and and give you the, the sources on, on all of that. So give me a second and I'll come back to that. Um, uh, here. So, so uh, I'll share the screen right again. Um, so here are the sources. Can I just jump in? I, I asked the question, uh, can I be heard? Of, of course. Yeah, okay, I'm Mindy Reiser. Um, of course, with a change in the overall economic and social system, the definitions of the personality types will shift. And, and that, that would be wonderful. We do have people who are drawn to law specifically for civil rights issues and human rights issues. And presumably they're a small percentage of the larger population. But again, as things change, even a new administration can shift things, can shift who decides to join the Justice Department. So again, these are not fixed categories. They're taken at a certain point at a certain time, and I don't know what the dates are, but it would be interesting to do such evaluations of personality types over time and in different countries with different legal systems, economic systems, and so forth. Yeah, no, Mindy, you raise a good point. I, I'm part of Stanford's Center for Legal Informatics. We call it Codex. Uh, we just had our future law conference uh, last week. And, and having legal tech that can fill gaps for personality blind spots in lawyers is really helpful. Um, not only from a, from a, have you considered all possible theories of the case, but uh, you know, there's a, a, a version of malpractice risk in, in having a particular personality, whether it's in the profession of law or, or medicine or engineering and thinking because of that personality uh, type um, that, that you, you don't have to um, look at certain possibilities. So, so I think as we automate decision-making responsibly instead of uh, arrogantly, uh, we, we will get more of those perspectives into the mix and, and that'll be healthy for everybody. Thank you. But, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mindy. George? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ramiro, and wonderful presentation. Uh, I work for the uh, Department of Energy in the Arctic Energy Office. And so we have many rural communities in Alaska that have multiple challenges that, that are similar to places in the developing world. And I'm wondering, part, part of what we need to do is, because there's not a lot of cash base in many of those uh, communities. And, mm -hmm. and so what we're looking at maybe is more of a cost avoidance approach where yeah. helping communities 
be healthier, you know, more self-reliant, et cetera, it reduces the need for outsiders to provide resources. Yep. Uh, are, are there examples that you can cite that we can point to to say like, now look, it works. So, so one that I always sticks in my mind, George, is uh, the UN has something called a famine anticipation insurance policy that, and, and I'll get this explanation, not totally accurate, but the way it, it is designed and Swiss Re was involved in this, um, Swiss reinsurance is um, that instead of waiting for the weather pattern to create the drought for the crops not to grow, you see the weather pattern um, emerge, whatever that season is. And right then you draw on the insurance policy to buy the food, to position it, to feed the people before they start. And, and that's an example of insurance. Um, it, we call it parametric insurance for the parameter of rainfall um, that would trigger the claim under the policy. Um, this is a huge opportunity actually in my redesigning finance class this quarter where we have Munich Re and we're looking at um, natural catastrophe uh, insurability. So, so, you know, when, when you talk about, well, who bears the cost of letting somebody else decline, let's say, or be at risk, it, it, it is a much healthier question. But then, George, as, you're, as you hear in that example, you're not selling the insurance policy to the people who can't afford the food. Right. You're selling the insurance policy to the governments or the, the NGOs or the multinational aid agencies who would otherwise be responding, who, who are saving the emergency cost of flying in food by having a planned cost uh, for flying in food. Um, it it so seems like organizations, can... yeah, I mean, it seems like organizations like FEMA would really benefit from something like this, by you know, building in anticipatory resilience and things like this. And speaking to your Jewish tradition, it reminds me of Joseph, right? Seven <laughs> yes. years of Yes, yes. Holy. Pharaoh got a good Jewish boy to take care of that stuff, you're right. <laughs> um, and um, I actually have a proposal for, for something uh, that I call Skybrella. Uh, that that we presented to the national um, uh, the NSC, and um, uh, it would instead of sending cash after a disaster for everyone for neighbors to compete against neighbors for construction services, what if we said you, we're not sending you cash? We're building a new house, okay, and we're buying those components and those services in bulk. So that's Skybrella and we can, we can talk about that. And I've tried to have USAID, uh, you know, because we've seen in Haiti, you get six houses rebuilt. It, it's kind of embarrassing, um, you know, as well as really dangerous for the people who survived um, the, the hurricane. And so um, we, we, this is all finance. This is all financial engineering, George. This is saying, don't, don't, you know, sit in your ivory towers at Stanford and publish your papers and expect that they're going to be understood on Wall Street or in Munich or wherever. They're not. You got to, you know, you got to work this and you got to, you know, I'm very um, lucky to have students that, that get uh, that, that they want to be an agent of getting their great ideas financed, not just expecting somebody else to, to you know, uh, why would you want to depend on uh, whether Congress wants to reauthorize anything? I mean, can we call that BS? And let, let what we need to finance as the real economy and the impacts of safety for the real economy, let's call that finance and let's do it. You know, amen. Um, thank, yeah. you. thank you, thank you, everybody. I think we're on the hour. I want to th thank you, Bruce. Thank everybody. I know there's a lot more questions there. We'll we'll, we'll uh, collect them, send them to you, Bruce. If we thank have you. your emails, we'll get back in touch with you. 
I want to thank everybody uh, for participating in today's collaborative. And again, a special thanks to Bruce. Excellent talk. I mean, we got a lot to do under peace engineering. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, George. Thank you for participating. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. That's the homework. Stay safe. <laughs>